You know, thus you saith know. the Lord, a, a powerful spirit of evangelism will mark the life of this child. In fact, signs and wonders and power will mark his life. He'll be so quick-tongued, so quick-minded, and so funny, you'll even find it hard to, 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 to discipline him. He'll talk his way out of things, into things. When you, when, you, when you ask him to come, he'll run the other way. He'll be filled with fire, filled with grace. But I will touch him deeply at an early age to serve me with all his heart. By the time his, he is six years old, I'll begin to do a deep, redemptive work in him. He'll love microphones. He'll love music. He'll love dancing. He'll, he'll love to entertain people. He will, says the Lord, love the limelight. Um, he will be a noisy child. He'll be a raucous child. Um, a quiet time to him will be high volume to you. But as I tame him and you train him, my powerful hand will come. And in the day will come, I will send him to the nations of the world. And my power will be on him. Uh, my blessing is, what are some of his daughters name? My blessing is on Haven. In fact, says the Lord, she'll be a haven for many. Um, she is going to be a very interesting child. She has an old soul already. Um, sometimes you feel like she was born about 14. And, and, I, and I don't mean in kind of a crazy, precocious way. I'm not talking about that. I mean in a good way. There, she, there's just a deep well in this child. Um, she, she's different, and you can't always figure out why. She's very deep in her thoughts, um, even already very moderate in her words, like she'll think about things before she says them most of the time. And want you to know she has a very, very deep mind as well. Um, she's very smart, very deep, deep in processing. She's going to love to explore things. She's going to be great with equations, with mathematics. Um, she is going to excel in all kinds of academic things. Um, and she's lovely. In fact, she'll even grow more beautiful. Friendships won't always be easy for her because she's going to take them very, very seriously. Um, she'll be tender of heart. She'll put a high value on loyalty. Um, she, she is going to be highly principled and very black and white by nature. Um, she's not going to like gray areas, not going to understand them, um, but I'm going to raise her up to be quite a leader, says the Lord. There'll be lots of education in her future, and my hand is going to be on her. I'm going to use her. Um, I'm going to make her a blessing. She'll have a, a superb gift of teaching that will flow out of her like a river. She'll not simply be your daughter. She'll be your friend at an early age. She'll love her dad. She'll love the two of you. And she'll understand you in ways that surprise you from a young age. She'll love her siblings. She'll love her church. And there'll be an ethereal quality at times that mark her because my spirit will be on her. This child says the Lord, my hand is on her. It, the position she has now, she is definitely going to be like love glue in the family. Love mom, love dad. But a strong spirit of prophecy is going to flow out of this child. She'll dream. And she is going to have a unique musical spirit that comes as well. She'll love to dance. She'll love rhythm. She'll love to sway. She'll love worship. My hand will be on her. There'll be a poetic side that works in her as well, says the Lord. She'll like poetry, line, verse, rhyme. Um, my hand is all of your children. All of them will serve me. Watch what I do. Pastor Josh, there is a spirit of Elisha that's upon you. And you are going to experience double portion anointing. Everything that you have imagined is going to be in double proportion. In that like manner, whatever God is going to assign you to do is going to become much larger than you have anticipated. And as the mantle of leadership will begin to shift to you, there will be even a double portion increase in all of the King's Cathedral ministry. 
in that same proportion of double portion anointing that's going to bring double portion, everything is going to happen faster and quicker. Anything that would have taken 10 years is only going to take five. Which normally would have taken two is only going to have take one here now. Whatever would have taken a season is going to happen suddenly. And the Lord says, my son, you've got to be alert. You've got to be ready because when it's going to break, it's going to be suddenly. And when it's going to break, it's going to be larger than you have anticipated. Therefore, lengthen the courts. Enlarge the territory. Increase your vision. Plan for greater things. Because when you are going to take that sling with a stone in them, it's going to become so powerful. And the giant that is ruling this island is going to come down. And God is going to give breakthrough to this island. Greater than anything that anybody has ever anticipated. And you are going to be an instrument. You are going to be a catalyst towards that on this island and whatever the locust have eaten up whatever the canker worm has destroyed you've got to get ready it's going to come back to you and you are going to see the increase you are going to see the reward you're going to see the restoration and you will see that this church is going to be a church of restoration of the presence and the power and the glory of Almighty God. People will walk onto this property and begin to sense the presence of God. People will walk through the doors of the sanctuary, not expecting what they're going to find, and suddenly they're going to walk into the blanket of the Shekinah glory of God. Some people will be slain at the doorposts. Some people will not be able to make it to the altar, but even in the foyer on their knees, they will cry out and say, what must I do to be saved? People will be carried out of this place because they cannot walk because of the presence of God. This place is going to be a place of the supernatural. Miracle signs and wonders. And it's going to happen suddenly. And it's going to happen powerfully. In the name of Jesus. Says the Lord, my daughter, I have watched you enjoying this season of celebration. I've watched you dancing for me. I've watched you laughing for me. I've watched you just enjoying every minute in worshiping me. And because you have been searching after me with a heart undivided, because you have been seeking my face, I will do to you as my word says, they that diligently seek me shall find me. And your reward is that God is now getting you to step up to the next level. And it will become the level of revelation and deeper insight into the word of God. And yes, you will have many young women following you. And yes, you will set an example, says the Lord, because that is the purpose why I have brought you all the way that you have come with nothing that, have, that you have walked through had been a wasted piece of experience. But you had to go through it 
so that you will know how to set the pace for the generations to come, so that you will be able to teach them and to show them, says the Lord. And yes, you will go places. And yes, you will become known. But you will also know that when the time is right, you will not go in a hurry because you cannot go unless my spirit goes before you, says the Lord. And therefore, as you settle down now and as you get ready for the next season, the season of deeper revelation, the season of an unbeknownst anointing, you will not be disappointed, but you will learn to spend even more time at my feet, says the Lord. Just, just let me repeat Psalm 2, verse 8, the healing of your inheritance. Isaiah 43, verses 16 through 21 is yours. All right, praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. Great pastor and wife. All right. Father, we're just so thankful for the privilege of being in your presence, and we're asking you to help us. Thank you, brother. That's great. Now, as we turn to your word, help us, Lord. Amen. Seventeen years ago, the second year of the prophetic conference, Dr. Dr. Morocco extended an invitation for me to come through Apostle Manuel Canastracy. 17 years ago, I guess I would have been like 41 then. So I'm trying to remember that. I'm, I'll, be, I'll be 59 here in a few days. And Dr. Morocco asked me to speak on a Sunday night. We'd never met. I got there. I did not know I would still be coming 17 or 18 years later. Um, other than our own family of churches, this is like my longest standing conference gig. It's kind of like just built into my I guess I'll retire from this conference. I figure 80, but Apostle C is 81. Maybe I'll go 81. We'll see. But anyway, and that Sunday night as I was preparing, the Holy Spirit spoke to me in a, a vision for that great house, which Dr. Jim Fink thought captured it. And he sent a lot of tapes out. I don't say that to say it was a great message. I say it just was the word of the Lord. And as I was praying for the church, I saw this massive water tower. How many of you know what a water tower is? Just, I mean, beloved, it was, it was so big, it's just hard to describe it. It wasn't like one of them little small country town water towers. Like, it would have watered Honolulu. It was gigantic, and I, and I knew it was King's Cathedral. I could see that. Now, as I looked at this water tower, I was stunned by what I saw. There were literally hundreds of spigots on the water tower. And as I meditated on that vision, it came back to me for the first time in years getting with it here in Maui, and I knew I was to share it with you. There were all different sites of spigots, and back in those days, we weren't even talking, I don't think about extensions yet or extending out, but I began to notice that there were big spigots, small spigots, and, and I just began to realize that, that God was going to do something in this church that out of his great wa water tower, he would just water the world. And he'd water multiple islands. Well, as I pondered that and the Holy Spirit brought this great water tower vision back to me, I saw something stunning which directly relates to this church. I not only saw the, the massive spigots in other nations, I not only saw the the multiple spigots of sites and extensions, whatever you want to call them. I saw something else that just I'm still trying to fathom. The next thing I knew, some of the spigots began to elongate and they shot out 
I mean, massively long. It reminded me of some of those um, things I've seen in the mid Midwest for corn, these long irrigation things. You've probably seen them. And massive irrigation, like pipeline sprinkler systems began to come out of this. And they were so long that there were thousands, beloved, of little teeny spigots coming out of it. And I realized that I'd seen cathedrals, and I realized that I'd seen extensions and sites, but now I realized I was seeing thousands of individual believers who themselves had become reservoirs and living wells for God's Spirit in every segment of society. Now, thus saith the Lord, I'm going to begin to water this great city through. And I'm not just going to water it through a great service and the spillover. In fact, you don't even have to wait for the rain to come to irrigate this city. For I'm going to raise up a people here who not only drink, but flow. And I am going to ignite the wells of my spirit in this congregation in such a way in such a magnitude, in such a power, that you will water your neighborhoods and your teams and your universities and your places of employment. There is a crop that God intends to grow here. As our country becomes increasingly pagan, non-Christian in her national expressions, and her laws, the water of God is important. You can plow faithfully, you can sow the seeds of evangelism, but without water, it is in vain. Now I'm going to entitle this message, Rains, Rivers, and Reservoirs, Releasing the Living Waters of Heaven. One of the profound pictures in the Bible is Revelation 22, 1 and 2, and it says, The angel showed me a river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Just imagine that. The new Jerusalem, the heavenly city. Out the great white throne, the sun by his side, proceeds as it has from all eternity, the very life of God. There is an eternal river that never runs dry. Drink of it. You'll live forever in heaven and not die. There is a river that flows out of the throne of God. And in this great vision in the book of Revelation, we find in its profundity that it's flowing down the middle of the great street on each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit. Every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of nations. Now, even more amazing than that is that the river of God, this river of eternal life, that's always proceeded out of the, the Godhead, that brings life and healing and destroys cancer and transforms souls and redeems men and women and brings faith. It doesn't just manifest in heaven. You realize you don't have to wait until you get to heaven to taste living water. Even, if anything, even more profound than the fact that there's a river in heaven. That river spills over on to the earth. The very river that proceeds out of the Trinity out of the relationship of God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, filled with love, transformation, healing nations, also flows into you. Then, you, then that question then comes, how do we release the living waters of heaven to the earth? What's it like as we sit here in a Oahu at this, at this great site, which I might add is going to burgeon and burgeon with growth. 
and a massively young harvest. Many of you my age, you're going to love this church because your children and grandchildren are going to love it more. I pick a church, I've always picked a church where my children are happy. They're my legacy. If I like the music too much, it worries me. If it doesn't seem too loud, I'm probably in the wrong church. I've learned that. All seven, all seven of my children love God. Now, three, there are three ways that God brings the rivers of life to a city. He brings them through the rain. He brings them through the river. And he brings them through the reservoir inside of you. Now let's look at this together. I, I, I'll take a few minutes here. I, in case you're wondering if I'm going to quit at 12, no, I'm not. Um, as, as Pastor Josh knows, I'm typically short-winded, not long-winded when I speak. This may take a few minutes. Three ways this happens. I'll do my best to have you out. Mm, 30 minutes, let's say. In this passage, we find something now. How does this work? One of the ways it works is the reign of God. How many are familiar with the reign of God? You've probably heard about it. You see scriptures like Psalm 68, 8, and 9, the earth shook, the heavens poured down rain before God. You gave abundant showers, O God. You refreshed your inheritance. And Hosea 6, 3 says, let's acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him as surely as the sun rises, he'll appear. He'll come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. Joel 2, 23 and 24 talks about the autumn rains and the spring rains. We're commanded in the book of Zechariah to ask the Lord for rain in the springtime. It is the Lord who sends the thunderstorms to give showers of rain. Now, the reign of God speaks of revival. How many of you are familiar with that? A revival is an unusual visitation of God through which he drenches a people or a place in his power and his spirit. Now, in reality, what revival does is reveal what we've been planning when there wasn't revival. And if we've been faithful when revival hit, Mass conversions, mass transformation. But, beloved, let me tell you, there is a little problem with revival also. Revival is not predictable. It's intermittent. It's not always consistent. And there's kind of a divine mystery about it. I pray for revival. I pray for visitation. But I'm convinced if I never see one, God can still transform this nation if you understand how he works. I, I was born into the Jesus movement. I can remember my high school aflame with God when I was 17. Down the road from me in, in Southern California where I grew up, one pastor baptized 25,000 college students in a summer. Jesus movement, charismatic renewal. My mom and dad were swept into the baptism of the Spirit in the 60s in the charismatic renewal. I went through the charismatic renewal, the Jesus movement, the third wave, and some of the little sprinklings we try to call revival sense. Do you realize, beloved, at the epicenter of revival was Southern California? How many of you know that's not exactly the new Jerusalem? Raise your hand. There's this myth we live on is that if we had revival, everything would change. Yes or no? Christian historians love to call 20th century the century of the Holy Spirit. It was also the century of World War I, World War II, unprecedented genocide and communism. Los Angeles, California was the epicenter of the Azusa Street Revival, the charismatic renewal in the greater L.A. area, and the third wave, and the Jesus movement, and it is the center of porn and smut in the earth. Revival alone will not transform a nation. I pray for revival, I believe in revival, but revival alone, although it is astonishing and I want it, it does not always have the results we expect. I pray for the reign of God. I love the reign of God. I'm so very thankful for the times I've had it. But I also understand that the ultimate hope of this planet is not revival. It is Christ being manifested in every believer by the power of God. Now, we also find, beloved, that God not only brings the rain of his spirit, he brings the river of God. There are places, beloved, in the United States, in Canada, other places, 
where the river of God just breaks out. Churches where all of a sudden the river of God comes. Ezekiel 47, 1 through 12 describes what happens when the river of God comes. We live in an hour right now where people have kind of given up on rain and it's all about the river. The river of God. Ever hear those songs? We want the river here, the river's there, the river's that, the river's this. And we got this new river culture. Now in Ezekiel 47, we find where God very carefully lays out for us, this is how my river operates, and if you don't get that, you may get wet, but that's all you'll get. I want to help you understand why does God release his river out of localities and what's it for. In Ezekiel 47, God is giving this vision to a young prophet named Ezekiel who was taken captive, captive out of a priestly family in his 20s. The, that fact, the prophecy of dry bones was his. His life would be marked by terrifying pain, laying naked in front of a model of a city besieging it, cooking his food over dung. One day God said, tomorrow morning the thing you love best is going to die. Don't mourn, don't weep. Preacher's wife dropped dead. He said, God says, now, now, I mean, his beloved gives him no easy life in his 20s. And after some years in captivity, he saw a great vision. And he saw the day would come when God's house would be restored. And there would be a glory on it. And when that happened, the glory he's seen leave, leave in the early part of Ezekiel would come back. And when God began to flood into that house, it says the sound was like the rushing of many waters. You see, when the river of God is getting ready to pour out of a house, God fills that house first. His presence fills it. His glory fills it. And as his presence begins to come in that house, water begins to pour out. But I want you to understand some things, and I'm not going to tarry here because I really want to get to the last point, but I want you to catch this. We come into Ezekiel 47. Here's what we see. Verse 1. The man brought me back to the temple. And I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east. And the water was trickling from the south side. Say the word trickling. Beloved, many times we get so caught up in the river in our church, we forget about its ultimate purpose. The river of God in that church, in the middle of the glory, look at me now, was trickling. Isn't that amazing? For all its glory, for all its power, because the tragedy of the river of God is most churches, when they get the river of God, become damned. And it never grows in magnitude because they trap it and use it to bathe and wash their children and meet their needs. It trickles. Trickles. It goes on to say, as the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured a thousand cubits and led me through water with ankle deep, another thousand, knee deep, another thousand, waist deep, he measured off another thousand, but now it was a river I could not cross because the water was deep enough to swim in. No one could cross it. He said, son of man, do you see it? It's interesting. As the river goes, its stages are described. See, when God begins to inhabit a house with his glory and his presence and his magnificence, and it begins to trickle, we get ankle-deep water. We got a little new anointing in our walk, a little easier to walk in God. You know why so many people get slain in the spirit? Because when the water's only ankle deep, you got to lay down to get in it. You to roll around in it, splash it around in it. I mean, the real sign of God's presence is not being slain. The real sign of God's presence is evangelism. You'll see it in a moment. But when the water's ankle deep, you've got to lay down to get in it. I get it. Okay. Now, then it says, it's needy. God takes you from splashing around, getting your own needs met, to all of a sudden prayer becomes an emphasis. Knee deep water. You're crying out. You're praying. But then it goes waist deep. It speaks of reproduction. And all of a sudden, something begins to happen. Now, it's interesting, it's important to note that in a little more than a mile, 4,000 cubits, the river grew from a gurgling trickle to a raging flood tide. 
And let me tell you by the Spirit of God, the farther that river got from the temple, the greater it became. God has a controversy with the American church. Thus saith the Lord, you dammed up my power through sin and selfishness. Controversy. We play in the trickle, getting our tickle, while the world gets increasingly worse, and we wonder why. And you find, beloved, that the power of God grew in magnitude, grew in might, grew in power. The farther it got away from the people. That's why an act in Paul's tannery shop, tent making shop, my gosh, scraps were planted off. Miracle flow. The farther they walked. You know, beloved, there's a lot of talk about in the river, in the river, in the river. And in reality, in Ezekiel 47, the ultimate purpose of the river of God is not to make you fresh and give you a fresh encounter. It's to give you fish. And I'll prove it to you right now. It's just not about you. You'll get fresh on the way and you'll get wet. But listen, the river of God, when it reaches its most powerful place, the prophet himself gets out. He says, there's a place in that river where you can't splash around anymore. There's a place in that river where it's not about you getting wet and you getting splashed. It's about the world being transformed. That's just what it's all about. That's just what God cares about. Goes on to say, current, then banks. I'm not even going to talk about banks. Listen, I love rivers, but if you've ever lived by a river that's overflowed at banks and destroyed your house, you don't love them so much. Rivers are dangerous things. And if the river of God does not run through biblical banks, Another message. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He gets out and he realizes, I can't just splash around in this river anymore. It's going somewhere, and it, the tide is pulling. But he noticed when he got out of the river, there were all kinds of extraordinary fruit trees planted alongside of it. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they'll bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. As much as people like to preach about the joys of soaking, splashing, swimming in the river of God, in this passage, only Ezekiel steps into the river and that's a survey. Let me tell you something. People talk, you know, I, they think they're inventing something. I'm soaking, I thought to myself. Heck, I've been soaking since I was a Christian. Is that like new? I mean, like laying around in the presence of God, you think maybe you just discovered that? I mean, if the only time you soak at church, I feel sorry for you. How can you make it just soaking at church once a week? I mean, you know, honestly, the best soaking is at home when you're alone. You can lay around more, do things, just soak up in that. I've been soaking the presence of God for decades. I thought everybody did. Now it's a big deal. We're soaking. I go, you think you invented that? Or maybe it's just a corrective thing so you'll do it more at home? You know, most of the things we do at church, we should be doing at home, soaking, listening to the word, reading the Bible, worshiping, thinking. Listen. The reason church becomes so much about our needs is we're not getting our needs taken care of at home before we get there. River just rumbling right along. Now, what are these fruit trees in light of Scripture like Psalms 1, 3 and Jeremiah 17, 7, 8? We have to wonder, is it believers? The man or woman who trusts in God is like a tree planted by rivers of living water. How interesting. What you begin to realize is the river of God, as you put your roots in it, as you learn to drink from it and stop just playing in it, all of a sudden, there's fruit that feeds your neighbors. There's leaves that heal their marriages, and things are breaking out. Now watch this. This is just like the pre-message. I'm going to get to my last part in a minute here. Now, he said to me, now hear this prophetically. The water flows toward the eastern region. Verse 8. It goes down into the Arabah where it enters the Dead Sea. This river... toward those regions where nothing will glow, where nothing will grow. The river, it says, is going toward the Arabah, toward the desert, toward the dead sea. 
the one sea in the world. I've, I've been to the Dead Sea before. There are no fish in there. It's just dead. There's no life in there. It's dead. It says the river of God that trickled out of the temple is raging toward those parts in the earth where there's no life. Many archaeologists believe that Sodom and Gomorrah are under the Red Sea. It's ruined. That's commonly thought. The river of God was never simply meant to get you wet. That was never the ultimate purpose. It's flowing now. Watch this. Toward the Dead Sea. I love this. When it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there, my glory, and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore from Engedi to Engilam. Man, that's the rocky places, the dry places. There will be places for spreading of nets. The fish will be of many kinds like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. The river of God is not simply meant for your pleasure. It's meant for his purpose. And if we trap it into our churches and turn it into something else, it's another facet of our own narcissistic Christian culture. We're missing it. The river of God, the farther it goes into a dark society, the more powerful. It goes into the Dead Sea and transforms it into the Mediterranean. In fact, when you look at this in the Hebrew, every type of fish found in the Mediterranean was found in the Dead Sea when it hit. Who are the fishermen? That is the church. That small group, whatever you call them, life groups, whatever you call them, fishing with nets, relationships, evangelism, changing the world. Now, the swamps and the marshes not become fresh, they'll be left for salt. That's another message. Now, the river of God's a wonderful thing. There are more rivers on the earth than there are currently rain. But let's break this a little deeper for my last point. I pray for rain. I build with a river. But I'm called as a leader, as a minister, to help you find the reservoir in you. The great revelation of God, a revelation that will change the way you think about everything, is that the river of God is not just in heaven. It doesn't just reign in revival. It doesn't just flow out of services like we had today. It flows in you. Now I want to illustrate that for you, give you a challenge, then pray for you. One of the most powerful analogies of all is the fact that every believer, every human, when they're born again into the kingdom of heaven, they don't just get a new name. They don't just get a new family. They don't just get a new righteousness and their sins are forgiven. They get a new nature. Before Adam and Eve fell, their human spirit and the Holy Spirit of God were fused together and the life and power of God, watch me, could just flow into them, just like this, just flow into them. But when sin came, that was severed. But in Christ, the human spirit and the Holy Spirit are reunited, enabling the power of God to flow into you the life of God, the life of heaven. How does this work? I want to give you a picture and then close with Jesus talking about this. In the book of John, two great analogies, John 4, John 7. We'll go to John 4. How many of you know the story of the woman at the well? Remember that story? It really should be called the woman who became a well. Jesus saw her. You would have not picked her triggered the first revival in the ministry of Jesus. She was broken, hurting, part of a culture that hated Jews, and the Jews hated them in return, Samaritans. That goes back to the days of the Assyrian Empire and forcible um, deportations and all that. She was a woman who'd been married five times, probably a prostitute, broken, hurting, now living with a man. 
when Jesus met her, and I'm going to take two of them and tell you the story, then we'll go to the principles. He looked at her, now catch this. You can go look at later in John 4. Says, Woman, give me a drink. I'm thinking, Jesus, why would you do that? She's hurting, she's broken. You're the kindest person in the whole Bible. Why would you ask this broken woman to give you a drink? It's because from the very beginning, Jesus was going to establish something with this woman. When I'm done with you, you won't need a drink. You'll be a drink. I'm going to open up something in you. She goes, how can you, a Jewish man, ask me to drink? Like, what do you want from me? Do you think I'm a prostitute? Now, catch this, it's so important. He said, woman, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you to drink, You'd ask me for one. She goes, oh, she goes, okay, and I'll explain this to you. He said, woman, he said, listen, if you keep drinking that water, you'll thirst again. But if you'll just drink, and you're going to find later the word drink is synonymous with the word worship. I don't have time to teach you about that right now. He said, but if you'll just drink of my water, not only will you get a drink, I'm going to create a well on the inside of you I'm going to give you a new nature, and you can drink, and you can drink, and you can drink, and you can drink. Well, then he kind of dealt with her sin and then talked to her, and she's just sitting there stunned. And then you find that amazing verse. She drops her water pot off and leaves. Why? Not just infant faith thinking, I'll never, ever have to come to this well again. She realized, I don't need a well. I am a well. I don't need a well. I am a well. I don't need a well. I am a well. I don't need a well. I am a well. That doesn't mean we don't come to church and drink because that helps keep our well open. That means we are wells also. Now watch this. Okay, you know the rest of the story. The disciples are having lunch. They've gotten hummus, pita bread, falafel, trying to make Jesus eat lamb. He's got this secret food. They're so caught up in lunch and hating Samaritans, they don't realize a massive revival is taking place while they're talking to Jesus. Jesus, you know, there's someone kind of reaping. Someone's doing a lot of work. Who's that? One old Samaritan woman revives the city. Now, break there and let's look at John 7. The great revelation of Scripture is that the waters of heaven can flow out of the wells in you. In John 7, Jesus stands up. On the last 37 of the greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Who's thirsty? festival or feast spoken of here is the Feast of Tabernacles. The festival is typically seven days. By this time, they're about eight days long. The booths were dismantled. On the seventh day of the feast, the golden flagon of water was taken by the high priest from the pool of Siloam and carried back into the temple. While the temple choir, choir was singing Psalms 113 through 118, male pilgrims would raise pieces of citrus fruit in their left hand, giving thanks to the Lord. And water along with wine was poured out as a sacrifice to the Lord. The time of the morning sacrifice, the poured water was symbolic of the Lord's provision of water in the wilderness. A lot to be said about that. But when Jesus stood that day, what was he saying? I am the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. I've got a water if you drink, you'll never lack a harvest. Now, catch this, and this is what Jesus said. If you want to be a well, in this house if you want to water this great island the Honolulu area this is what's necessary number one are you thirsty if any man any woman is thirsty let he or she come to me you mean Pastor Jim I don't coming to church is not enough no it's not you can come to church and not come to Jesus Coming to small group, not enough? No, it's not. You got to come to me. The ultimate purpose of Josh and Shannon in this church is not to give you everything you need in this service. It's to equip you to keep getting it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. If you do not come to him, you will, will never flow the same. Come to me and drink. The word drink here, we find in John 4, the word drink and the word worship are synonymous. What does it mean to drink? Let me explain. I'll give you an analogy that we've been hearing a lot about water in the conference I hear. Basically, 
How many of you have indoor plumbing? Raise your hand. How many of you are thankful? Raise your other hand. When I was a mission, missionary in the jungles in a war zone, we had no indoor plumbing. Um, and our outhouse had no roof. So during monsoon time, it was quite an interesting be in the outhouse, to say the least. Okay, now, indoor plumbing is a wonderful thing. But if I went into the fourth world or the fifth world and found a primitive tribesman and brought them into my home and said, I'm going away for three days, you got all the food you need, all the water you want, they could easily die in my house, not for lack of water, but for lack of knowledge. What do I mean by that? Because even though my house has indoor plumbing, if they don't know how to turn a faucet, press a button, pull back a lever, the water's not going to come. The moment you were born again, you were replumbed by heaven. The very life and waters of God can flow into you. Then where are they, Pastor Jim? Well, they're waiting for you to press the button, turn the valve, crank the lever. How do you do that? Every time you worship, every time you pray, every time you read the word, every time you confess the word, every time you hear a message, every time you fellowship, every time you pray in your prayer language, every time you raise your hands, you turn the valve and the water of heaven floods into you. The longer you do it, the more it flows in. It doesn't even matter what you feel, it is just a fact. You've been replumbed through the divine nature and every time you worship it flows. So Jesus says this, if you're thirsty, Come to me and drink, synonymous with worship, and if you believe. This is why being in the house of God is so important, because your belief system is shaped, and if it's not reshaped, you're never going to experience what's next. Okay? You're thirsty. You come to me. Okay, Jesus, I'm going to come. You begin to drink. You begin to worship, not just when you're in church. Basically, we demonstrate in church what you should do every day. Wait on God, worship, listen to the word, speak the word. There's a beautiful corporate dynamic which you can't live without, but you best keep doing it at home. I mean, if Pastor Josh has to revive you every Sunday, not much is going to get done. It's just a fact. Now, but if you believe, Jesus says, as the scripture says, that's why the preaching of the word is so important. It defines who you are, where you're going, how do you do it, how do you study the word, that you're a man or a woman of God, no matter what your parents thought, you have an incredible destiny. Jesus says, if you believe what the scripture says, catch this, out of your belly, out of your well, will flow rivers of living water. Oh, what's that mean? You just worship so much, you just pray so much, you just wait on the Lord, that well of yours begins to flood out of you, and you begin to realize as you go to foundations and teaching and hear the word, that hey, I can prophesy, I can invite someone to church, I can encourage, I can minister, I can share my testimony. Beloved, it's not about knowledge, it's about the flow. And once you begin to believe, I mean, the woman's the well catch it. She's been saved, however you want to define it, five minutes. She walks into her city, and she preaches the worst message in all the Bible. Hey, there's this man out there. She's stunned, and, and people are stunned, too, because she never talks to him. She's looking at them in the eyes, and they realize, man, her skin looks different like. She's not slinking around anymore. She says, hey, there's this guy out there. Man, she goes, whoo. People are going, what? He just told me every sin I ever did. People are thinking, that must have been a long conversation. I mean, I go, whoa, every sin. She goes, yeah, man. She goes, whoo, I'm a little dizzy. You know, I'm kind of wondering, you think he might be the Messiah? That's just a terrible message. But the whole city emptied out and begged him to stay and teach them. And revival broke out. And they believed he was the Messiah before the Jewish people did. What happened? She believed. And the river flowed. She walked into her city, water just spilling out. Water of her testimony, eyes look better, shame gone, not slinking around. People go, she's different. Some people are think, I kind of, I some people are like, I kind of wonder how much she sinned, who she sinned with. I better go find out. I mean, it was an interesting testimony to say the least. People magazine would have published it. Now, beloved, listen to me. broken woman minutes old in the Lord can revive a city, what might she do if you'd flow? If 
you bleed. If you drink, what might you do? And Jesus says this in the end, 39, and he spoke of the Holy Spirit, which had not yet been given. Well, he's been given today. The Holy Spirit regenerated you. He lives in you. He'll empower you through the baptism of the Spirit. Let me summarize this. The great river that we see in heaven flows to the earth. It comes by rain, it comes by river, and it flows out of the extraordinary reservoir in you. The great sprinkler system I saw, one of them, I see the words Oahu written on it. Hundreds of little sprinklers interconnected through love and fellowship in the bonds of spiritual family. And it's, it's, it's just interesting. I see it just going through Hawaii. It was so crazy. There's little feet under it. It must be you. And you're just walking together with spiritual family through this area, irrigating sections of this island that haven't had rain for years and have never darkened the door of a church to taste the river. So in other words, they can taste the river in you. It's just not about you. It's just not. Man, stop splashing and start crashing through the gates of hell. I mean, beloved, do you get this? The waters of heaven are in you. The waters. Stand to your feet. Turn to the person next to you and point to them right now and say this. The waters of heaven are in you. Let's do it again. The waters of heaven are in you. Now say this. The waters of heaven are in me. The waters of heaven are in me. Now, Holy Ghost, I thank you for this great congregation. May they, as one people, irrigate. Places in this city where rain has not come and the river has not flowed. Stop waiting for the river to flow out of somewhere else and let it flow out of you. I need the river. Well, look in the mirror. I need Pastor Josh to lay hands on me. You may need to lay hands on yourself. God's irrigating this city. He's chosen to use hundreds and thousands of channels. Not just one massive faucet. Not just one or two anointed spigots. No, no. He's irrigating. He's irrigating with this river through you. Pastor Josh. Amen. Wow. You know what's pretty amazing? Is that we, we come and we have this prophetic conference and as incredible as this prophetic conference is, there are things that happen within the prophetic conference that are prophetic. And we don't even really understand. You just, it wasn't even intentional. It's just the flow of what the Holy Spirit's doing. We didn't even talk to the pastor about what was happening in our church. But you know, I, I just want to let you guys know, this is how prophetic this moment is. Because just this month, September 14th, we're going to be doing our first Aloha Fest block party at KPT. We're going to be taking, the Lord gave us a challenge to take Aloha Fest, which we do at the last Sunday of every month, and giving away thousands of dollars of gifts and feeding everybody and giving away groceries. We're going to be taking that to our communities. We're going to be going all over the island. We're going to do the first one. We decided to do this last month. We're going to do the first one, the 14th of September. And I need everybody to be involved with it.
See, God wants to use you. Get your finger like this. Put it in your chest and say, God wants to use me. <laughs> I'm the river. Flowing. I think we need to give Jesus a shout of praise. Come on. I think we can do better than that. Come on, shout hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. <laughs> thank you, Lord. You may be seated. I want to do something that is very significant. This conference, I had someone come up to me and say, well, Pastor, why do I have to pay, a, pay for a prophetic word? I said, you're not paying for a prophetic word. You're paying for a conference. We're not paying to get a, a, a prophetic word. Does everybody understand that? At the same time, we bring these prophets from around the world to come and bring forth words like they did today. I want to continue to have the prophetic conference. But this morning, the Lord spoke to me as, as I was getting ready for church that I truly believe that this is a turning point in our church. And this is not just a turning point in our church to become what God's called us to be. But I even believe that there's a turning point happening in people's lives because this is a prophetic conference in the financial. Now please hear me, please hear me, because I truly believe this is the word of the Lord for this church. There are many people that have come to this church, you desperately need a job, you're going through situations in your housing, you, you, you have to have a vehicle, there are things that you desperately need and breakthrough that you have to have. And we've cried out to the Lord, but we've forgotten the simple principle of giving. That when we give, it's given back to us, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And we've been eating our seed instead of putting it in the ground and believing God for a harvest. And I believe that this morning, please hear me, this morning is your day of victory. We're a part of this prophetic conference, and we're going to take a prophetic offering. I'll say it again. We're going to take a prophetic offering. Now, this, this offering that you're taking is going to, to really meet all the needs of this conference. Very, very expensive conference. The conference alone costs close to $130,000. But I think it's worth it. Amen? And that's what this offering is going to. And I need you to help me. Because as you give into the prophetic word that has come forth, there's a release that's going to come on your life. Can I get an amen? Ushers are going up and down the aisles right now. You may say, well, pastor, I don't have a lot of money. It doesn't take a lot of money. It's not about the amount of money. It's about the amount of sacrifice. Can I get an amen? Jesus looked at the woman with the two coins and said, wow, what a generous woman. This is. Look how much she gave. She gave more than all of you. It wasn't the amount. It was the sacrifice. And I truly believe that God is going to do a supernatural miracle. Today is a day of release. As you're writing your check, as you're getting out that money, I want you to declare it with me. Everybody say, today is a day of release. Today is a day of release. You know, I'm excited about doing that Aloha Fest block party. We need a, we're going to be, we're going to be putting up tents and doing barbecues and we're going to be feeding people. We're going to be giving away gifts. It's going to be an incredible time. You're all welcome to join us. I say, let's just go get KPT saved. Amen. Come on. Come on. Any, any KPT people in the house? <laughs> My goodness. Everybody has an envelope of these. Put your hand on that envelope. We're going to pray. Father, as you showed me this morning, as you put a word in my spirit, that today is a day of supernatural release. Lord, as those who are here begin to give, as they step out in faith, Lord, I ask that those things which they are crying out for and believing you for, that today shall be that day of release. Those who need a home, those who need vehicles, those who need a job. Lord, I declare by the word of the Lord 
come forth in Jesus' mighty name. There are even people here that have been waiting for a, a financial release in support that has been promised to you. God says it's coming. Get ready. Father, I thank you for your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's get. everyone to stand to your feet if you would as we close this service this morning we must pause for a moment and do one of the most important things that can take place there are people that have come here this morning and even as pastor LaFoon was speaking within your heart there was a tugging and you begin to ask yourself where am I in my relationship with Jesus Christ you may be here this morning You say, Pastor, I'm not 100% sure that if I died today, if I'm on my way to heaven. Maybe you know that there are things in your life that you need to get right with the Lord. Today is your moment. You don't have to wait till next year. Now is the time for salvation. You say, well, Pastor, I've said the sinner's prayer a hundred times. But you know there are things in your life that you need to deal with. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's fear, greed. Whatever it may be, I'm going to ask you this morning to just bring it to the Lord. So will you do this right now? We're going to make a call. For all those who are here, and you can be honest with yourself. You say, Pastor, I need to get my life right with Jesus. I know. I feel his tugging and his calling right now. Pastor, will you pray for me on the count of three? Will you lift your hands? One, two, three, right now. Come on, with every, come on. Oh, I see the hand, I see the hand, I see the hand, I see that hand. I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand. Come on, there's hands going up all over. I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand. Now I'm going to ask you to do something. In no way ever in this church is, our, is it our intention to embarrass anybody. But I want to ask you to, first of all, be bold in your faith. Jesus himself says, look, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. But if you acknowledge me, I'll acknowledge you. So I want to give you an opportunity to acknowledge Christ and the decisions that you're making right now and make a bold statement. But I also want to pray for you and pray with you. If you raised your hand, maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you're serious about this. You know that today is your day to get your life right. Today is the day to be 100% assured in where you stand in heaven and with heaven. The moment we begin to sing this song, Lord, I give you my heart. Will you step out on the aisle and will you join me here so that I can pray for you? Ready? Get set. Go. Come on. Lord, I give you my heart. Lord, I give you my soul. Lord, I live. Oh! 
know it's really simple what we're about to do. You're about to make a decision to surrender your life to Jesus fully and completely. It's not just a prayer that you're about to pray. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Do you know what that confession is? It's the acknowledgement that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and that he is who you now have allegiance to. It's an acknowledgement of surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. But this is the powerful thing. If it was about money, hardly any of us could go to heaven. Except for the people on the ridge up there. It's not about climbing some high mountain. There's nothing that you can do to deserve and to earn salvation. And that's why Jesus came. It's called grace. And when you believe in Him and you surrender your life to Him, you are saved. Your sin is washed away and you're made clean. Pastor, it can't be that simple. It is. And right now, I'm going to ask every one of you here to say this prayer with me. It's a prayer of faith, acknowledging Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Will you all say this prayer with me right now? Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. Purify my mind and my heart that I may serve you with everything that I have. Jesus, I believe with all my heart that you died for me and that God raised you from the dead and you are alive. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I surrender my life fully to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, can we give a shout of praise to the Lord? Now we're going to do this around you. Around you are some leaders, and they're wonderful men and women of God. But I want to tell you something that's very important to me. The book of Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says this, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. You know, you've all said a prayer this morning, and that's wonderful. But you know what you desperately need? The power of the Holy Spirit. Come on. He's going to help you. He's going to strengthen you. I want every single one of you, you say, Pastor, I want the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. I need the Holy Spirit in me. I want you to lift your hands right where you're at. If you're down here, right now, just lift your hands. Maybe some of you are out in the aisle or out out in the congregation. You say, I need some more of the Holy Spirit. I want you to come down here right now. Come on, if that's you and my leaders and our pastors are going to begin to lay hands on you, I just want you to lift your hands right now. Everyone else, I want you to stretch your hands out towards these. And Holy Spirit... We ask for you right now to come in supernatural power, for we desperately need you. We can do nothing. We are nothing without you. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit.
Come on, let's give a shout of praise to the Lord this morning. For Lord, you are good and you are awesome. I want you to join hands with that person next to you. You know, I know, I know service was a little long this morning, but it was worth it. It was worth it. You know, we'll, we'll go out and we'll pay money to go watch a movie. Sometimes these movies, they last three hours and we don't even think anything of it. But that church service better end in an hour. You know, sometimes it takes time in the presence of God. And if there's anything that you got, I want to give you a challenge for this week. Don't just let God be my God. Let Him be your God. Spend time with Him this week. Get into His presence and let His life and His power flow through you this week in your job and everywhere you go. Amen? Father, I pray a supernatural blessing upon Your people. Bless them in their coming and in their going in every area of their life. Lord, I ask for supernatural direction. Lord, lead them and guide them. We pray for your spirit to just overwhelm them totally and completely. Lord God, that their lives will be led by the spirit and not by the flesh. I pray, Lord God, that we will live lives of faith and not by sight. And Lord, we glorify you in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen and amen. God bless you.